receive and to learn. So I pray, Father, that we hear from your Holy Spirit today, that even as I speak and teach what you've given me, Father, that you would continue to teach me in the moment, Lord. That I would not be seen or heard, but you would be seen and heard working through me, Father, and that you alone would get all of the honor, glory, credit, and praise. And God, we recognize this morning as a family that you have all power to do whatever it is that you want to do. And so we're grateful that individually this morning you're doing a work in every person. So I pray that we would surrender to that work. We would surrender to your hand of authority. We would surrender to your power. We would allow you to do everything that you want to do in and through us today. And we love you, Father. We love you because you first loved us. And we love you because you're willing. You're willing to do the work inside of us. And so help us just let go and surrender what we think, what control we think we have. May we not buy into that lie. But may we surrender it all to you in the precious name and the blood of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Everybody said together with excitement this morning, church. Amen and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. And amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4. Jeremiah, chapter 4. If you do not have your Bibles, look with someone next to you. And if they do not have one, you can read along on the screen in just a moment. Over the past few weeks, I've briefly shared with you the failures of my football team. They're now 0-3 without a single win. As a competitive of a person as I am, it is the only area in my life, and this is not arrogance, it is the only area in my life where I am a loser. But I have no control over that. And the only reason I do not abandon them is because I'm too faithful of a man to do that. And so in that, I'm still a winner. Oh, boy. My favorite part about Sunday is being able to teach the Word to every one of you, so I'm blessed that you're here and I'm grateful. Let's get into Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning with the first verse, the word of God says this, praise the Lord. If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord. And so here we have God giving a word here. If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord to me, you should return. Okay, so listen to the way he's saying it through the prophet here. If you return, if you're going to return at all, you better return to me. In other words, what he's saying is, if you want to be sorry, then be sorry and do right. How many people in this room before have been sorry and still did wrong? Everyone should raise their hand right now. <laughs> so he's saying, if you're sorry, be sorry and just do right. Okay? And this is what it says. If you, verse 1, chapter 4, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1. If you return, O Israel, declares the Lord, to me you should return. If you remove your detestable things from my presence and do not waver. And if you swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in righteousness, then nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, verse 3, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Stop right there for just a moment. The, the people were guilty. Let me tell you what they're guilty of. They're, they're guilty, the people that he's speaking of are guilty of trying to serve both God and their idols at this point in history. They're trying to they're trying to serve God, but they're also serving self. Anybody ever done that with me before? Right? Everybody else is lying. They 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 they've tried to make God happy, but also make self happy. And whenever we're outside the will of God, listen, we can never we can never make God happy. Amen. And so, if making me happy does not include the will of God, then I'll never make God happy. Everybody understand that? But if 
doing the will of God makes me happy, then when I serve the Lord, I'll be happy and God will be happy and it's a win-win. Amen? Amen? All right, so what they're guilty of, and God is speaking to them, uh, they're guilty of trying to serve both God and their idols at the same time. Now listen, church, today if we're not careful, okay, if we are not careful, it becomes it, it become so easy to fall into the same trap. Amen? So easy to fall into that same trap. The things that we enjoy doing in life must not ever interrupt our relationship with Jesus Christ. There's how we know if it's become an idol or not. There's how we know if it gets in the way or not. The things that we enjoy, the pleasure that we have in life, nothing wrong with having enjoyments, nothing wrong with having pleasures, but when it comes in the way of serving God, faithfulness and obedience to God, when it gets in the way of obedience, then it becomes sin. And we have to be very careful of that. Look at the first verse, please. In the first verse, God says, If you return, O Israel, to me... Everybody say to God. If you return, O Israel, to me, you should return. And so maybe you're here today, just maybe you're here, and you've fallen, you've walked away from faithfully following Jesus Christ. And if that be the case, I'm here to tell you the good news is that Jesus Christ is the only way, and he accepts you back fully, completely, and wholly today, just as you are. And that's good news to you. Uh, go to John chapter 6 quickly, please. Gospel of John, chapter 6. And let's look at the 66th verse. The words of eternal life. You know what? I just feel led by the Lord to back up a little bit. Go to verse 60. John chapter 6, verse 60. I don't know. The sound room's not going to have that, but I'm putting you to the test right now, brother. We're going to go John chapter 6, 60 through 69. And look what, look what takes place here. John chapter 6, verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Yeah, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? And then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Verse 63. It is the Spirit, capital S, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is how much help, church? No help at all. As a matter of fact, let's, let's read verse 63 out loud together. On the count of three, verse 63, one, two, three, go. No help at all. Isn't that something? No help at all. Look at your neighbor and say, your flesh can't help you. This is why we cannot follow the desires of the flesh. This is why we cannot follow the passions of the flesh. Because it ain't going to help you at all. It's only going to get you into trouble. Verse 63. It is the Spirit of God who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. How many of you all have ever been led into temptation before and you know that your flesh is pulling you that direction? You could just feel it. You just the self-pleasing, self-pleasing, self-pleasing. When you feel like self-pleasing, you need to get away from that direction. Amen? Because your flesh is never going to lead you into a good place. It just said it's no good to you at all. Right? If there, be, if there be any goodness, it's just to hold your insides from spilling out all over the carpet right now. You understand? It is the exterior shell that God gave you to keep your insides from just becoming a mess. You understand? If you didn't have your skin on you when you got up to leave, your neighbor would have to say, hey, hey, you left your kidneys right here. Come on back. <laughs> Dragging everything behind you and whatnot. Your flesh is no help at all. So when your flesh says, hey, go over there and do that, you better not go over there and do that because according to the word of God, it ain't leading you into no promised land. It's only going to lead you into a land of destruction. So look at it, look at it, verse 63. It is the spirit of God who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you, Jesus says, are spirit and what? Life. 
words that I have spoken, and this is why it's so important that we remain in the word of God. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life, verse 64. But there are some of you, watch this, verse 64, but there are some of you who what? Do not believe, he's speaking to them, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Verse, but you know what? Let me just throw this out here. Uh, if you didn't know the end of the story, you would never know who was going to betray, betray Jesus because he loved them all the same. Isn't that amazing? You, you, you never could have looked at the way that he did or did not love Judas and the way that he did and did not love Thomas and Matthew. No, no, he loved them all. There was no did not love and he loved them all. You understand? Isn't that amazing about our Lord? So if you're here today and you feel like you've done something so bad that the grace of God could not uh, forgive you, that the mercy of God has not uh, been withheld, let me, let me just tell you something. The mercy and the grace is unending. The forgiveness is unending when it comes to Jesus Christ for you right now in this moment. And no matter what you did, he ain't going to love you no less. He ain't going to love you no less. Verse 65. Amen. Amen. Verse 65. Yeah, let's just give God a clap of praise. We don't want to hold that back. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother, for setting everybody else free in here this morning. I appreciate you. It's okay to do that, ain't it? Verse, verse 65. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And so Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? This is a tough word that's been given here. He's talking about earlier how uh, if you eat of the bread, my flesh, and drink of the cup, my blood. Okay, this is a, this is a big thing that he's, that he's going into referencing. Let me just tell you, it said that no one comes unto, unto the Father unless the Father draws him. If, if you're here and you're, you're, you're just feeling something inside you stirring, and when we give that altar call at the end of every sermon, if you just feel like you can't sit still, like your insides are just want to bust out of your, out of your flesh, and just like, I, 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 just can't, I just can't contain myself, that is the Spirit of God drawing you unto himself, and you need to be obedient to that call. It doesn't matter who's standing around or who's looking or who knew you before you walked in the door or who was partying with you last night. You better be obedient to the call because it just may be your last opportunity that he calls you in. And so when it comes to your soul being saved, you, you better not check up for nobody else. For nobody else. Look at John chapter 6, verse 66. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Verse 67, so Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? In verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? What an amazing response. He says, Lord, where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to go? To, to whom else are we going to go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. No, where else are we going to go? Isn't it amazing that they had already figured that out? How beautiful that is that they have, they have come to the point in their faith where they're saying, Lord, where else are we going to go? I've seen what you've done and I heard what you've said and I know that you're the only one. Where else am I going to go? Have you, have you had that resolve yet? And we know later on that the, the disciples still aren't acting perfect, but, but do you at least have the resolve that, yeah, even when I fall short, I'm still recognizing that there's nowhere else to go but into the arms of Jesus Christ into the word of God. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom, to whom shall we go? You, you have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know you that you are the Holy One of God. He says, we've come to know you as that. And they've spent time with him. Listen, if, if you're here today and you just don't know the goodness of God, if you're here today and you just don't know what Jesus has done for you, if you're here today and you just don't understand what the Lord can do for you every day of, of, of your week, every week of your life, listen, it's just because you haven't come to know it yet. You come to know it by spending time with your Lord. You come to know him. You come to know him. Verse 70. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Aren't you glad that every one of you in this room have been chosen by Jesus? Every one of you have been chosen by Jesus. I mean, listen, that's great news. Every one of us have been chosen by 
by Jesus. You may say, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not saved. No, but listen to me for a moment. You're here. You've been chosen by God to be here today so that your soul might get saved here today if you just surrender and let them. And if you're willing to receive salvation, you will be saved. But Jesus Christ is the only way. And in the first verse of Jeremiah chapter 4, God tells the people that they must get rid of their detestable things and he reminds them that they cannot waver. Now listen to me, church. Listen to me, please. True repentance means you need to not only ask for forgiveness for the sin you committed, but you also need to get rid of any of the materials that help cause the sin. In other words, if, if there's someone struggling with, 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 with drugs, someone smoking with, uh, struggling with smoking pot, what you can't do is repent today and ask God to forgive you and go home and not flush the rest of the pot down the toilet. That's not true repentance. In other words, you can't pray to be alcohol-free but keep a case in the fridge for the just-in-case moments or just in case I become weak or just in case I need a sip or just in case you can't leave a bag of dope hidden under the basement of the house for the just-in-case moments that the kids drive you nuts. It can't be a just-in-case. Let me tell you what your just-in-case is. It's calling on the Holy Spirit of God to well up in you in the moment to give you strength to be an overcomer through Jesus Christ. You cannot rely on a crutch. You need not a crutch when Jesus Christ is the stability Ability in your life. And so a stable man, a stable woman, a stable young person, a stable child, listen to me, does not need a crutch. Because you're standing on the solid rock of God. Solid rock of God. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to stay on the rock. Right? Look at your other neighbor and say, firm foundations. Look at somebody else and say, firm foundations. Somebody else and say, firm foundations. It's all about, church, listen to me, it's all about the firm foundation. And so where are you standing on? What ground are you on this morning? You cannot be standing or leaning on a crutch. It cannot be on a crutch. There cannot be a what-if moment. The attacks will come, and so if you allow there to be a what-if provision, then you go use the what-if provision because it's available. Amen? It's available. I've never been able to stop eating cheesecake as long as the cheesecake was in the fridge. I'm just confessing right now. And when, when people give me one, I'm like, oh, I don't need this thing. But I take it home, and I'm like, it is such, it, it's like a sin to just throw that in the trash. That woman worked, <laughs> that woman worked so hard. She worked so hard, and I'd be throwing money. And what happened to the man that didn't invest his money? It would be terrible. And I can't, I can't, I can't, no one else in my house eats it. So please, everybody, just help me, help myself, and don't give me that. Because when you do, I end up eating all of it, like within three nights, so it don't go bad. Yeah. And so as long as, as long as we leave the materials, we're going to go to the materials in our weak moment. Amen? As long as we leave the substance or whatever it is that we're addicted to, it's going to be there. And listen to me, I guarantee this, a weak moment's going to show up. A weak moment is going to show up. There's no one in this room that's not had a weak moment. There's no one in this room that's not going to have another weak moment. And God tells them in the first verse of Jeremiah chapter 4, he says, uh, you must get rid of their detestable things, and he reminds them they cannot waver. God says, return to me. Look at it, verse 1, chapter 4. God says, return to me. Do not waver. Get rid of the things. Basically, he says, get rid of the things that are sin in your life. Go to, me, go to, go to, go to Jeremiah, chapter 4. Jeremiah, chapter 4. And we're going to look. We're going to look at verse 3, and let's get that on the screen, please. And we're going to read that out loud, because it's too, good, it's too good not to. Jeremiah, 
chapter three, chapter four, verse three. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three, go. Now, I want to talk to you today about your fallow ground. Fallow ground is ground that has been plowed and ready for sowing, but it's then been withheld. It's, nothing's been done to it. And maybe you've gone past a pasture before uh, where it's no longer any woods. It's, uh, it's not grown up into briars or anything like that, but it does have some growth coming. Uh, the birds like to come down and get whatever's coming up from the ground, uh, but the ground has been uh, plowed up in the past. It's been tilled. It's been ready. But then it just sets, and it's just waiting. It's got great potential, but it's no good as long as it's not being used for the purpose that it was plowed up for. And so it sits, and it sits, and it sits. Everyone in this room, at its salvation, you become born again. Amen? And so there's ground, you are ground, that is ready to be used. And there's an area when it speaks of this fallow ground, because in the Bible, multiple times it speaks of fallow ground. Sometimes it's talking physically, it tells the farmers what to do, but other times it's speaking spiritually. Because so I want to talk to you spiritually for a moment. Because maybe there's, just maybe there's some places inside of us that God has already tended to for victory, but rather than walk in that victory because we enjoy the way that it was beforehand, before it got all busted up and tilled up, we enjoyed reaping the, what we thought was the harvest in the world, right? Because that's what it was. And so when God came in and made us a new creature and he begins working on this ground, rather than us continue to allow him to cultivate it and throw seed on that good ground, we don't want to deal with that because that takes change. And so rather than change that area of my life and have to get rid of those people in my life, I really love that pleasure and I really love doing and pleasing self and pleasing the flesh. So I'll change on this side and I'll, I'll let God harvest this side for, for, for a good reaping of a harvest. But this side just becomes fallow ground. And see, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. If it goes too long, the wrong stuff will start growing. That's dangerous. One of the places that I hunt, um, part of the ground had become fallow for so long that now it's more of a mess of a piece of property than it was before they cleared it. And it's just, well, we're not, we're not going to mess with that piece of ground anymore. And now it's done grown up so thick. After all these years, uh, what was one of the best spots for us to hunt has been grown up so thick in briars and just mess that we can't even get through it anymore to, to hardly hunt it. We don't like going through that, but I tell you what does like living in it. The deer love living in that, don't they? So listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. If you allow that fallow ground to remain fallow but for so long, I'm talking spiritual. I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking spiritual. If you allow that fallow ground to sit but for so long and you allow things of the world to creep back in, you're going to have things living in that part of your heart that need not be there any longer. And see, God has worked hard to bust that ground up. And then rather than continue to allow the seed be sown in that area on that ground in our life, we just allow it to continue to be run over by the wild again. And how many people have been in the fallow field before? I know I have. I know I have. A, where God has been trying to do a work. Remember, I'm talking spiritually here. Where God has been trying to do a work and instead allowing him to continue to bust up that field. I just said, no, 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 God, you can't. You can't. No, 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 no. I like that spot. I don't. No, 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 no. And then what happens is it turns fallow. And God tells the people here, he says, bust that up. Bust that up. A.W. Tozer said a great, a great thing about fallow ground, spiritually speaking, not physical. I don't need all the farmers attacking me here. I'm not talking about physical. Go with me spiritual for a moment, everyone. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, the crow loves fallow ground. The birds of the air love fallow ground. They come in and they pick the little seedlings of the things, of the weeds, and that have just grown up and have no purpose other than holding the soil in place. He said the crows love that. He says uh, the, the fallow ground, A.W. Tozer says, if the fallow ground was a person, uh, the fallow ground can dangerously become comfortable. Tozer says because he does not feel the sharpness of the blade of the farmer's plow. He says, however, the ground that's been plowed up, although it hurts the field, and sometimes it pierces and busts up hard situations and pulls up hard rocks, and gets down into the shallow roots of the weeds. He says the field is better off after going through the pain than the fallow ground that never got broken. 
But we can refer what A.W. Tozer says, then we can take that uh, back to the, the context of the potter and the clay. How many, time, how many of you know that sometimes God just has to shatter things and break things in order to put them back in the way that he planned originally? And sometimes we, we take our own plan for life and we try to mold it into one direction and God lovingly says, no, 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 no. And if we run from the no, no, no too long, it, it then becomes a firmer love and a firmer love and a firmer love. And so maybe some of you in here have been broken under gentleness and maybe some of you have been broken under the sternness of God. Either way, God's going to win. Let me tell you why God's going to win no matter what, because he loves you. Can we say amen to that? God's not going to leave you. God's not going to forsake you. Listen, this may sound hard for some folks, but there's some, God has shown me someone on this side of the room that needs it. It's time to say it. God will crush you if that's what he's got to do. He will crush you because he loves you. Because he loves you. And that's not a mean God. That's a God that loves you so much that he's been calling, trying to change you, change you, change you, change you, change you. And you've been running, 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 fallow ground, fallow ground, fallow ground, not letting the plow of God hit it and break it, hit it and bust it up, hit it and get the old roots out that keep causing you to sin. And God will just love you so much that he will invade your territory and crush you. And you say, oh, Pastor, no, 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 let me just tell you, take it down to Saul before he was Paul. God invaded that man. And thank God he did because God used Paul to write most of the books of the New Testament. And so God loves, listen to this, God loves to take a man that's running for him and use him to prove the goodness of himself. God will prove the goodness of God. He will prove the goodness of himself by taking a man, by taking a woman, by taking a young person that's been saying, not me, not me, not me, not me. And then one day, yes, me, sorry, God, use me. Use me. And so that, that journey that you've been running from, when people look at your mess and your nonsense, they'll have to say, yep, 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 only God could have done that because that person's been running for years. Only God could have done that. And so some people, some people have to be broken. Maybe you're here today feeling exactly like that. And somewhere in your heart, somewhere in your life, you've, you've got a field that's fallow ground, it, it was once plowed and made ready. You once had passion to serve in that area. But over time, whatever reason, whatever sin, whatever lie you've believed in, whatever excuse, you've allowed the ground God once plowed in your life to sit and become stationary and become useless. So here's a question. And I don't need you to answer this out loud. You just keep it between you and God, please. What field in your life have you been withholding from the Father? What field? Maybe it's evangelism. Maybe it's ministry. Maybe it's talking to a family member. Maybe it's talking to a coworker. Maybe it's doing more Bible studies. Maybe it's having more prayer time. Maybe it's having your own worship time at home when you first wake up. Whatever it is that God's been calling you to and you've been running from it, what is it? It's time to confront it today. Fallow ground can become dangerous. Allowing things to spring up if not caught in time. The field left unused can eventually, over time, grow up into thorns and thistles. And as I said earlier, things begin to hide out. Until eventually, part of you looks like you were before you got saved. That's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. Turn with me, if you will, to... Hosea, chapter 10, verse 12. going to read this. We're going to read this out loud together. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. Everybody there? Let's get that on the screen if we can. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12. On the count of three. One, two, three, go. Go. 
Three directions there. Three directions there. Look at it. We can keep that up there for a moment. Thank you, brother. Look at it. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek who? In Jeremiah chapter 4, remember God was telling the people, he said, he said the same thing in Jeremiah chapter 4. God said, if you're going to return it all, return to who? Me. He said, if you're going to return it all, if you're going to repent it all, if you're going to be sorry at all, return to me. And so here in Hosea chapter 10 verse 12, he says, break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to what church? Seek the Lord. When is the time to seek the Lord? Somebody answer that. All the time. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. All the time is the time to seek the Lord. But in this part of the text, what he's getting at is to the individual that has let something lie in their life, let something lay that they haven't sought the Lord on. And he says, you've got to bust that ground up. And in the process of busting it up, you've got to seek me for it. You've got to seek me for it. You've got to replace what you've allowed to come in between you and I that has caused that ground to lay still and kept me from being able to work in it. You've got to come to me so that I'll remove that for you. Remember, if you could remove it yourself, it never would have been there in the first place, would it? If you could remove it yourself, you wouldn't be struggling with it. If you could do it all on your own, you wouldn't still be fighting it. And so even in your prayer to God, sometimes have you still tried to hold on to the situation? And you can't even do that. Listen, if, you, if you're going to ask God to come in and move in and just drastically take over, you've got to surrender, step back, and really just give it all to him. Uh, fellas, whatever side your woman is sitting on right now, just guard yourself. Be ready. I'm going to ask a question. Prepare yourself. How many of you wonderful men have a, have a wonderful woman that when you drive, she drives in the side seat? Anybody? I was, I was riding with someone recently, and he said that his wife, when she sits in the passenger seat, she's got her own brake and her own steering wheel over there. <laughs> Sometimes I think that we're just like that when we pray. God, I really want you to do this, but... <laughs> right? And God, I, I really do want you to do this, but then I'm hitting the brake in the physical the whole time. I ain't ready for that. I ain't ready for that. Uh, my, 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 the, the, the spirit's calling me to be ready, but my flesh is, no, 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 keep that ground hollow, keep that ground, keep that, keep that ground fallow, keep it fallow, keep it fallow, right, we, 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 we can talk a good talk, right, we can talk a good talk, but it's one thing to actually walk the walk and allow God to bust the ground up, isn't it, it's a whole other thing to let God get on the ground and bust it up, and so we say one thing, we do, we do another thing, put that verse back up if we can, please, Hosea chapter 10, Thank you. God bless you. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Sow for yourselves. What are we to sow in the field? Righteousness. So whatever is in your field that's not righteous, you need to start to sow righteousness. Say, Pastor, how do I sow righteousness? By reading the word of God and doing what it says. Obedience is righteousness. Everybody understand that? You be, if you're, look, if you're going to read the word and you're going to be obedient to that, that's righteousness. Okay, that's righteousness. So sow for yourselves righteousness. In other words, do what the word tells you to do. Reap steadfast love. Okay, now that's a, that's a love, that's a love that ain't bending, okay? So I'm called to love you no matter what you say about me, amen? Okay, I'm called to love you no matter what you do to me. I'm called to love you and I'm called to forgive you, which is part of the love process. I'm called to forgive you no matter what you've done because if, according to the word of God, if I want to be forgiven, I've got to be able to forgive you first. Everybody understand that? Okay, I've got to be able to forgive you. And so who am I to hold? Any, who am I to harbor any type of transgression? Who am I to harbor any type of hurt or pain or anger towards anyone in this room when I myself want forgiveness whenever I seek it? And so a steadfast love is what I'm to hold on to. Let's get that verse back up there, please, Hosea chapter 10. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord. We seek the Lord through worshiping him, praising him, listening to him, reading his word, just being still in a moment and just saying, God, whatever you want to speak to my heart right now, I'm giving this time, Father, to you, right? I mean, ask yourself that. When's the last time you've done that? When's the last time that you were willing to ride down the road and not turn the radio on, not listen to the phone, not do anything on the phone, but say, God, I got 20 minutes in this vehicle, and Lord, I'm just going to ask you, whatever you want to just rain down on me through your word, just speak to me, Father, just speak to me. Look, you're riding down the road anyway. You're riding down the road anyway. But Lord, just, just speak to me. I'm, I'm going to turn my phone off. I'm going to turn the radio off. 
Lord, whatever you want to work on my heart, I'm just removing the busyness, and I'm just going to allow you to shower my heart with your will. With your will. Okay? Uh, same thing if uh, you go to bed with the TV on. I'm guilty of falling asleep watching television. I don't have one in my room, but if there's a game on or something like that, I watch in the, tele in, in the living room. I want to watch to the game. Next thing you know, I wake up, and the game's off, and I got to walk back to the bedroom, climb up in the bed, go to sleep. Anybody else guilty of just falling asleep in front of the television? Okay? What, how about take the time that really means nothing and just make it mean something by giving it to God, right? And just, 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 just those little moments of being able to go lay down into the bed and just say, God, what is it, what, what is it that you're speaking to me tonight? What, what, what is it? How many of you know that when you wake up in the middle of the night, that's not by accident, it's a situation, a circumstance? Anybody in here ever woke up, couldn't go back to sleep? That's not a kitchen run, that's a prayer run. Amen? And sometimes you think, well, it's a bathroom run. Well, make it a prayer run while running to the bathroom. Right? But it's an opportunity. All right? We've been awoken. It's an opportunity. God, what are you speaking to me here? What are you speaking to me? I've been praying to you on this situation. Are you speaking to me through this? All right, let's get it back up on the screen, please, Brother Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. Thank you, brother. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord that he may, what? Come. All right, look at your neighbor and say, God's coming in your life. Because let me tell you, can I just tell you how we know that? All right, let me just tell you how, how we know that's a guarantee. Because if we sow righteousness, if we reap steadfast love, if we allow God to break up the fallow ground, then it's time and we seek the Lord. Then it says that when we do that, he's going to come and he's going to rain down what upon your field? righteousness. How many people in here want to walk in the righteousness of God? All you got to do is seek him. All you got to do is seek him. And the scripture says he'll rain down his righteousness on your life. All you got to do is seek him, right? Now let me tell you, let me tell you something. I, I, I've known drug addicts that have gone home and flushed down everything they got. And I'm going to tell you what, man, that, that just not rains down righteousness on them. It even does to me too. Has someone's testimony ever been a blessing to you? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, somebody that you've been praying for, and then they tell you something that happened took place, took place in their life, and you're like, woo -hoo -hoo. You can celebrate with them. Have you ever celebrated with someone else for their business before? Right? For what God has done? I mean, it just has just, just blessed me immensely to hear the testimonies that people can proclaim what God has driven them to do. And when your field gets rained on, right, and someone else's can get rained on too. You understand? There's runoff. There's runoff. Runoff is a big deal. Let me just talk. I feel led in the spirit. This isn't in my notes, but I do feel led in the spirit to say this. R runoff, runoff is a big deal. Do you know nowadays it's hard to even build a parking lot anywhere without creating a retention or a runoff pond? Everybody understand? So runoff is a big deal. We look at it as water. When, when, when we built the church, we had to be real careful with the direction uh, that, the, that the parking lot went because so much water in such a large area was going to run in a direction that eventually would run near what? Somebody else's property. And so they look at runoff as a, as a really big deal. Well, what are you, if you, if you move this, how's it going to shift this? And when we did the backyard, I remember them, uh, the county talking to me about, well, you got to be really careful because if you go to moving things, then the man's land next door might become a creek or a pond over there. He may not want a creek or a pond over there. Uh, so runoff is a big deal, but there's always going to be runoff when rain comes. And you think about that spiritually for a moment. Remember, I don't want you to think physical right now. I want you to think spiritual. There's always going to be runoff. In other words, my cup over fills up and does what? Overflows. There should always be a runoff when it comes to the reign of God, when it comes to the righteousness of God. In other words, don't you just let your ground get wet. Call someone else and get them wet too. Amen? Hey, because we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the what? The word of our what? Testimony. So you go get someone else's ground wet too. Amen? Because they just may need the encouragement from what God Almighty has done in your life to spill over and run off into your field, into your ground. And don't hold captive what God has done to you. Don't hold captive what God has done for you, in you, and through you, but allow that to run off and mess with someone else's land. You got to let it run off. And that's our job. That's our job, to share the testimony of what God has done. Now let me just give you a quick little insight that I've learned throughout the years of following Jesus. The more you tell people what Jesus did for you, the more you're going to see Jesus do more in you. 
And I'm a firm believer in that. I'm a firm believer in that. It's no different than having a good little local restaurant. Not a whole lot of people come to it, but when, as soon as you start talking about it, talking about it, that restaurant can begin to fill up on a good reputation. You understand? And more good business happening. The more you share the good things that God and his spirit is working in your life, and the more you boldly proclaim and the more you release into other people's lives, God will continue to shower and rain the righteousness on your field because he knows that you're going to be faithful with the things that he's given unto you. And the more you're faithful with what he's given unto you, the more he's going to release and entrust in your life. And see, that is not a prosperity message. That's a truth message. That's a truth message. So turn with me, uh, if you will, church. Let's get on to Luke chapter 6. Verse 46, and watch this, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. Now listen to what he's saying here. He says, everyone that does what I tell them to do, he says, I'm going to show you what that person's like. So here it is in verse 48. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well what, church? Well built. Look at verse 49. I know you know the rest, but let's just be reminded here. But the one who hears and does not do them, the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, Immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was what? Was great. Um, I'm reminded of uh, when I was much, much younger, and we used to live in Chesterfield. Uh, we thought we were so cool because a group of us got a bunch of shovels uh, and stole a bunch of wood and materials from our parents, and we went off into the woods, and we built, a, we built this crazy-looking underground den-type fort thing, and then we went up from there, and we, we built a floor, and then we went up from there, uh, and, and we built another floor, and we went up from there, and we built another floor, and we went up from there, and there was a tree house. And there's no exaggeration. My parents are right here. They can attest to this thing because it was behind their property. And whenever they looked outside of their window, they saw a monstrosity of a four-level fort uh, that was just put together by a bunch of elementary school children. Uh, I was, I, I'm to this day impressed, although it, to, to the adult's eye, it probably looked like a trash heap, but to a child, it was a kingdom. My dad said it was a monstrosity. At least it was large. Walking through the woods one day, we found a big piece of trash. Uh, to us, it was gold. It was, it was yellow, and I mean yellow. Yellow shag, and I mean shag. Carpet. And as young boys, we thought, hey, we can have carpet in the treehouse. Didn't care that it was trash. Didn't care that it was, who knows what was in it, man. Now I'm thinking as a 38-year-old man, I'm thinking, what were we laying in? We took that shag carpet and we hung it up in that tree house on the top level because it was, it was just good stuff at the top. One day the parents come home from work and they look outside, you know, I mean, when they got family come over, it's pretty embarrassing, you know, but it was cool, man. I mean, I love them that they let us keep this thing up there. And they come home and to put the icing, the yellow icing on top of the cake, they come home and there's yellow shag carpet hanging out of this tree house. It was a blessing because they allowed us to keep it. I want to talk to you about the foundation of that for a moment. The bottom only lasted for a couple years, and it fell over and rotted and fell apart. There was no foundation. We dug deep. I mean, we had an underground section, and it was pretty cool. And we made the idea of going in there at nighttime with flashlights one time, and we all crawl in through the tunnel, and we're, we're down there in this underground pit, and there's four or five of us because not everybody could get out of their house that late at night. They didn't have permission, and 
we're all down in this hole and we climb through this through this underground tunnel we get down through there and we're we're in there man and everybody's like ah this is so cool man it's dark someone says turn the flashlight on and at that moment i learned how many animals live underground <laughs> at night flashlight came on and another flashlight came on and another flashlight came on and I ain't seen so many critters crawling on the walls. To this day I've never seen that many bugs on the roof and every one of us was fighting to get out that tunnel first. Scrambling. And maybe your life is like that spiritually. Maybe you feel like you've done a lot of work. And maybe there's times where you feel like it's just a mess. The reason is there's been no foundation. And what foundation you do have has not been the foundation of the Word of God. God says that the person who does what I tell them to do, when the storm hits their life, they're not going to be shaken. But to the person who doesn't do what I tell them to do, when the storm hits, it's going to be a mess. Let me just talk to you about something firm on a tree. Years and decades later, I ride through that neighborhood. New family living there. The ground fort is gone, which tells me the underground fort is gone. The second level is gone. The third level is gone. And for years, the treehouse remained, at least pieces of the floor. But after a couple decades, I ride through the neighborhood and I just look back up there to see the tree and the tree was still there. And you know the one thing that was left on that tree? The yellow shag carpet. Let me talk to you about the nail in the tree for a moment. They weren't our nails. They were our daddy's nails, which meant they were free to us. We put so many nails in that thing want nothing tearing it down unless they took the tree down with it and they just didn't want to take the tree down do you know that when Christ was pierced on the tree that there's not a thing in this world that can remove off the cross what he did for you and me when I rode through that neighborhood and seen that carpet hanging I'm just reminded that everything that Jesus ever did for me still stands to this day and no matter what I do No matter what I say, he's always willing to forgive me for my ugly imperfections, no matter how terrible they seem to myself or to anyone else in this room. He is always willing to give mercy and grace and forgiveness and salvation to every one of us in this house today. Amen? Amen. Go with me quickly to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. This is what the Word of God says, praise the Lord. Matthew 13, verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them and other seeds fell on rocky ground and where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil but when the sun rose they were what church? They were scorched, and since they had no root, they what, church? Withered away. And this is the dangerous thing about being in a fallow ground. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And he who has ears, let him what? Hear. Now with that in mind, we're going to close with this part of the text. Look at verse 18. Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 18. Because Jesus Jesus just speaks of an an instance about sowing seed and uh, what kind of ground it's going to fall on and the ground that's uh, not ready, the ground that's not been prepared. 
We know that nothing good's going to come out of that in that moment other than just being temporary. But look at verse 18. Here, then the parable of the sower, anyone who hears the words of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and what church? Snatches away what has been sown in his heart. And this is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root where? In himself. And if someone says, Pastor, why does the word of God not work in my life? It's not the word of God that's the problem. You got no root in there. All right? You got you to allow that, that word to get in and get established. Get established and take root in your life. You've got to be willing. You've got to have that good soil. You've got to be willing to allow there to be a root taking place. You've got to be willing. Look at your neighbor and say, you've got to be willing. Watch this. Uh, the evil one comes, verse 19, and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And that's key, okay, because... Oh, you've probably seen people like that in and out of church. They endure, they endure for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he does what? Falls away. When things get hard, they go back to that what-if scenario, and that little bag that's in the drawer is still there, or what's left in the fridge in the garage is still there, or that woman that you should not be messing with is still there, or that man that flirts with you and you're okay with it is still there or those group of people that you know you shouldn't be hanging with is still there, or that lunch table, young people, that you shouldn't be at is still there. Okay, we've got to be careful when hard times come that we don't run back to who we were before we got saved. Amen? Okay. So look at what it says in verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves what? Unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Let's stand and pray. You see, maybe you're sitting here today and you say, yeah, pastor, but it does say that uh, for the one who receives the word on good soil, he understands it. I, I just don't understand everything uh, that I read. I don't understand everything about this faith and this Jesus that you're speaking of, and I wasn't grown up to have a relationship with the Lord. See, listen, God's not expecting you to know everything, but God does expect you to know Jesus. And see, that should be a relief to some of you in here. And maybe some people have been just struggling with that. You feel unworthy. You feel unwanted or unneeded. You feel like you could never measure up. And God's not asking you to measure up right now. God just wants you to know who Jesus is. And then through the strength of Jesus, you begin to learn. You begin to learn. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit teaches you everything. It says that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. And so if you're here today and you've not understood something that you want to understand then you just need to surrender to the will of the Lord and ask for the Spirit of God to show you. Ask for the Spirit of God to release to you what it is that you're looking to know, what it is that you're looking to understand through His Scripture. Asking the Spirit of God to teach you things that you cannot teach yourself. And God will do that, maybe not in the moment that you're expecting, but at just the right time, God will teach you exactly what you need to know and greater things than that God will teach you what He wants you to know, which is on a much higher level than what we can even begin to fathom. A much higher level. So what we need to understand and come into agreement with and grasp today is, what's important here today is that we know Jesus. The Bible says He is the only way to receive salvation. He is the only way to eternal life. He is the only way to heaven. And Jesus Christ is the only way to avoid hell. And the good news is, you don't have to do anything to earn that ticket to salvation. Jesus Christ has already paid the price. And just like that yellow carpet hanging from the tree that could not be removed because so many nails had pierced it. What Jesus did for you on the cross 
when he was pierced with the nails in his, in his wrist and in his feet, when he was pierced in his side, what he did for you never has to be done again. It is final. It is eternal. It is everlasting. It is never ending. And it holds true forever. Forever. It holds true forever. And so today is the day for salvation. Today is the day in the way of the Lord. Today is the day. Today is the day. And if you've not asked Jesus yet to save your soul, then the question you must face is, why not? What are you waiting for? You're playing with faith. You're playing with time as if you owned it. And you don't.